How's everyone doing today? It's Friday. Happy Friday. Can't believe AHK Con is tomorrow. Um, oh, it reminds me, I'm going to put the uh, fr link. Um, Fridays. Hey. Oh, it's Isaiah's. What a surprise. <laughs> How is it? I see John showing up. Awesome. Oh, great. Hi. Hello, John. Hey, John. Hi. 
um, welcome everyone. Um, don't forget, HKCon is tomorrow. If you're going around, you know, we'll be recording it and share it after the fact, but we're not going to be live streaming it on YouTube. So um, it'll be, there's a Zoom meeting though. Okay. Yeah. Tomorrow is the day, yeah? <laughs> Here finally, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Trying to join the wrong meeting. I was trying to, I was going to do a little practice run on my tablet um, to see if I can, you know, annotate the screen and, and um, do something from it, from the tablet. Just thought it might be a little bit easier. So uh, who's got something to work on? Work from home hacker. Nice name. Oh, I heard I meant to help. Here's Guy. I'll probably show something later on, but um, I'm just finishing something about it. So I will show it later after your questions come in and so on. There's Guy's big bottle of vodka on his table there. He's. <laughs> yeah. Started, started early with the drinking today, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's hey friday guys. yeah hello yeah. guy how are you happy doing? friday happy friday so it's friday you, you, it's, it's good you have to yeah <laughs> uh, how's everyone doing good i i wasted a whole day trying to search down a a problem uh, in order hockey and oh, wow. um i finally figured it out and it was so it was so frustrating. It's like, um, well, the, and that guy. I mean, who knows how you know if it would have helped? But that's where I always tell you: find someone else that you can just bounce ideas off of. Because often, like I said, Isaiah is a far better programmer than I am, right? But yeah, he'll get stuck on something. And he's like, Joe, can you look at this? And, yeah, all the time. Yeah. Half, I'd say roughly half the time he ends up solving it without needing my help because he's yeah. explaining it to me and his brain triggers. And then the yep. other time I bring up stupid stuff and he's like, I, you know, wouldn't well, I wouldn't have thought of that well, one. <laughs> let, let's put it this way. I'm, I'm messing about with ACC stuff and reading stuff off and formatting text on, on the screen. And I've got my tool window as a, as a uh, parent, um, you know, and um, it keeps on recognizing the tool window content, not the parent window content. Um, so I have to destroy the tool window in order to read the content off the screen. Oh, so basically what is going on is that you you are trying to get information from the main window. Correct. But when you were doing the WinExist or whatever function yep. you were using, the string that we're using, like HK class, whatever, yes, was actually pulling the topmost window, which would be a tool window at that moment, right? Yeah, which I'm generating uh -huh. um, through AutoHotKey. So mm. I've got to kill the tool window and then read the screen, and it works. But it took me forever to to figure that one out <laughs> because I've got I've got the um, the tool window um, mm -hmm. being a child of the of the main window. Okay, but here's the thing. Is it possible? Uh, can you share your screen and see, show what you're using to target that window? Yeah, because absolutely. Probably, probably if you change the string that you're using to target the window, you can target the correct one. Maybe well, are you using well, the window title or? I'm the using the name? window title to get the HND. Mm -hmm. So for the tool window, when you generate it, set a title different than the main one. It that is. Should... It is a different title. They both have different titles. Mm -hmm. and, but and, because and it's a see. child window, when you refer to the main window, oh, I didn't know that. I actually have never. Yeah, when when that. it's a child window mm -hmm. and you refer to the, the main one, the main yes, because this tool window is on top, it, mm -hmm. it's 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 reading stuff off that. The moment mm -hmm. I destroyed it, it worked fine. So you know. Uh, so when I double click now, the first thing it does is destroy the tool window, read the data and, and rewrite the tool window. It's quick enough, but uh, it's just, it took me a while to figure that one out. No, it's just because it's a child I window. I didn't know that one. I actually yeah. didn't know that when a child window is displayed, I know that it is always on top of the parent and that you yeah. could actually, if you 
you can make it so that you cannot interact with the parent either. Yeah. You can do that. Yeah. But I didn't know that if you were trying to get text from the window itself, from the main window, Correct. that just because the child window was on top, that you couldn't do that. I didn't know that. So um, I tried hiding it. It didn't work. Mm. Um, so I had to destroy it. And then it worked fine because I'm thinking, why has my ACC stopped working? It was working fine. What's happened? <laughs> you know, um, you know. That's why I asked you last week: was there corruption to my ACC file or anything at all? That's what it was. Mm. That, okay. that is actually something good to know. And related to that that you just mentioned, um, we had a very nice issue this morning <laughs> with nice. a script that was actually working just fine. A few days ago, now just from the sun stopped working after we ran a tool. Yeah. So there's one one little detail. You know these issues with file encoding, and I would say that John might probably know about that more yeah. than I do, right? <laughs> but there are certain commands like file open and file append that you have a command that is called file encoding in which you tell AutoHotKey, okay, use this file encoding. And whenever you open a file or, or save a file, it would use that file encoding for your purposes, yeah. right? But it so just happens that the any command, the any read and any write, don't, it doesn't obey that particular command. So even if you set your file encoding to UTF-8, right? or UTF-8 without BOM, which is like yeah. the raw one. If you read an ini file and that file contains Unicode characters, when you get the text... It's all messed up. Hockey, no, it's not going to be messed up. And that was what threw me off. It was not messed up. Yeah. But when I was trying to do string replace on it, yeah. string replace was not doing the replacement. And I was like, why? And, and, and I had my file encoding set up and everything. Yeah. But it is being ignored. So your main auto hotkey script must be in UTF-8 with a bomb character in it for any read to read the files correctly. Well, when, um, it I, was I, I, so weird. I have my UTF my my script actually file encoding sixteen. Now uh -huh. you can save. You can load it up in Word, mm -hmm. and you can save the any file as utf-16 uh, as um yes and then it works fine yeah so, um, so and you can pick up that. and you can pick up the auto hotkey file in 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 auto in in uh, notepad and mm -hmm. you can save you can save that as utf-16 yeah but here's the thing so if you let's say that you are running auto hotkey and your file is already in utf-8 right yeah. So, so, so auto hotkey, your script is in UTF-8, but your ini file is in UTF-16, right? Yes. When you read the file, you can, depending on how you read it, if you read it with a file read, yes, you can tell it, read it in UTF-8. That's okay. Yeah. But if you use ini read, it's never going to read it in UTF-8, even if you have the file encoding command. Is what I'm trying to say. Okay, now I get that so because read, I have read, some kind of like uh, uh, ignores that. So John, I have, go ahead. I have some Chinese. I have some Chinese characters in my ini file <laughs> on purpose, oh, right. and I I need the UTF-16 in order to read them. That uh -huh. file should be saved at 16. Right. So um, the moment the file saved in, is in 16, and and is UTF encoding for the code is it's working fine. Okay. My, my experience is that uh, at the beginning for, um, I think it was for Rus pop up at that time, the ini file was created by the script if it did not exist so that I, I created a default ini file. Mm -hmm. And at first I created it without uh, specifying any encoding and it was done in ANSI, I think, mm -hmm. uh, or, or, I, or I specified ANSI, I don't remember. But I, I discovered at some point that I had issues with uh, special characters that, that requires Unicode uh, encoding. Uh, and then I discovered that Windows, if and if you create uh, any file using any write, the, the auto key command any write, it will be created in uh, UTF-16. But if you create the file before and name it something.ini, 
it can be NC and it will work except for the characters that would require uh, uh, more developed encoding. So, um, but it's better to always, and at some point I just converted all the files that were used by my various users to, to uh, UTF-16 so that everybody was okay with uh, any special characters. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just to clarify on this thing, because I have another problem that is, I think, related to this. The file encoding command, UTF-16, does it affect the any file? The answer is no. You've got to save not the any file use, separately. Not, not if you use any right. If you create okay. a file with file append, if you create the file with any encoding, it can be named .ini, and it will be read by any read. Okay. But but, but when you write, but when I and when you write to a, an existing file that is not sixteen, uh -huh. I think it will just keep the existing encoding. Yeah, that's what I was going to mention. I think it doesn't. Whenever you use it's the, it, it, the yeah. whenever you use the any commands like any read or any write. Especially any write, I think I haven't tested. It would overwrite the encoding of the file to be the one from Windows. I think I haven't tested. Yeah, I don't remember. It was my experience with files created by the script using file append, mm -hmm. not being sixteen and being kept as they were, even if I was using any write after that. So we should okay. we should make a, a small test that, and that, see. And actually, happen. I could do it. And maybe it changed well, in Windows XP and Windows. Uh, guys, it changed was at the time of Windows XP when I had this situation. Okay, I, I have exactly this problem that rather than writing a test, you can look at my window because I'm having this exact issue with another bit of code. Uh, what it does is when someone rings in, it takes a caller ID and writes it with a file append to a file. Okay, it, it was working fine. What I can do is I can create the file. I can create a write test to the file, as mm -hmm. in manually, when I just select the lines and hit run. Right. But it won't do it programmatically. I know the data is coming in, but it won't write to the file. So I no, can... But, but we can just definitely create a very short test right now. Like, for example, let me, let me just do this. So uh, first of all, we need a file append. So file append. And will you share your screen? Yeah, we'll share it. Yes, I'm sorry. He was just going to describe it to us. <laughs> if encoding is new to everyone watching this, um, Jean, who's here, he he led a webinar a couple of years ago, right, Jean, on encoding, and yeah. I, I learned a ton at that webinar because it, it's not something that's like really taught that you pick. You know, you have to struggle through it. But it was great having a an actual you know webinar on it. If you're and we had a, we had a tool. Yeah, and we had a tool that was inspecting files to to see the difference the between encoding. the various encodings. Right. Yeah, it was it was funny. I just wanted to mention in any editor that you're using, you usually have a way to change the encoding somehow. So that's what we are referring to, the encoding of the file. And usually, and this is something that is in the auto hotkey help file, uh, auto hotkey prefers UTF-8 with bomb. If your file is not encoded like that, usually you can specify the encoding using the file encode command. But as I just, you know, uh, as I was describing, it seems to me that there are some, um, some uh, different types of commands that kind of like ignore that particular option. So let me go ahead and uh, we're going to do a, a quick test. The first thing that I'm going to do is just file append something. So let's go ahead. Test equal. So no, let me let me do this. Let me just create this section. It's going to be default, a new line, and then it's going to be test equals some info, right? So this is what a a, a, a normal um, any file would look like. This n here would be a new line character, so that's going to be two lines of code, and um, Right now, go ahead. the you guys segment my highlighting. I was just testing using the tablet. Sorry, <laughs> no like problem. You touch the tablet and draw just like you'd want to. It's a little more useful. right. Okay, so right now, um, in a, I'm just gonna send it, set, uh, set it into a file in the desktop. Let's call it test.ini. That's okay. Now, what I want to do 
is uh, open that file and see what encoding it used. So I'm gonna go ahead and open the file, whatever editor you use. And here at the bottom, I could say that the encoding is UTF-8 because it opened automatically with that encoding right now. So I got it here, it's, sorry. I got and, it here. Uh, just a, a note, Isaias, if you don't have a, an editor that shows it, you can use Notepad and do save as. Right. And when you do save as, the, the, the current encoding of the file is mentioned we'll be... there and you could change it and Notepad would convert your file. Right, so uh, we could some, go ahead some... and yeah. show just in case. If you want to know and you don't have any tools that do that, you can go to the desktop or whatever is saved, select all files if it is not a text file. And when you open it, once you open it, you can hit save oh, as. Yeah, and it's written, I see that it's written also in the status bar, but... Uh, right. And, and the particularity the... of Notepad is that when you change the encoding in the save as dialog box to, for example, uh, 16, it will convert the file and it's not all editors that will save as and converting the, um, the an existing file to the new encoding so my safest way to change the encoding of a file is to use the the most basic tool but notepad is doing this very well right awesome so Excuse basically interrupt. Yeah. If you're no don't worry that's a good especially for people who have never dealt with encoding before this is good information so in general we know that the file has been saved correctly and that it has the utf-8 encoding um, there are two different encodings for utf-8 one is utf-8 and uh, which is raw commonly known as raw and one utf-8 with bom so the bomb is just three characters that are added at the beginning of the file that tells whatever program wants to open it that is UTF-8. Now, those two are the same. The only thing is that this one at the, at the bottom has a special characters at the beginning of the file that you cannot see. But don't worry about it. It's just a formality. Now, be mindful out of hotkey prefers UTF with bomb, even though the whole world has already agreed that it's better without the bomb. <laughs> so that's something that I, is a pet peeve of mine. Like everybody in the, if you go and research the topic, everybody's like, yeah, don't, don't put the bomb characters in it. The, 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 the advantage of the bomb is that it tells the program that it is UTF. And if there's no bomb, the program cannot distinguish between NC, which is the old basic encoding, mm -hmm. limited encoding, I would say. Mm -hmm. Okay for English character, but not if you do English language, but not if you use any other languages. Uh, so that's the good thing with UTF with bomb is that it will be distinguished. It, it, there is no ambiguity is what you're trying to say. There's now, no the other, the other question for you is the 16. What's the difference between the two, the LE and the, and what should I be using if I'm using 16? Well, 16 is that whole topic about encoding is a little bit deep, but yep. Windows itself defaults to Unicode, uh, the UTF 8 16. The, the size of the Unicode characters is what matters. Um, in Unicode 16, you can encode way more characters than in UTF-8-8. That's the that's mainly the big difference. And the way how they put the file, the, the characters, you encode the characters in binary in a specific way, it changes between formats. So Windows prefers 16 because it allows for greater encoding okay. more characters and UTF-8. But UTF-8 is the smaller one that is used all over the yeah. web and in okay so 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 when you save in in um notepad you have two options of 16 16 and le and 16 be left e so yeah that that's that's why yeah. encoding is so complex which it's, one should i be yeah. using to yeah. work with auto I, I i cannot answer your your question directly i can just explain that le and b there are two bytes at the beginning beginning of the file that tells the, the type of encoding and with LE, no, I'm not sure if that, I, I, what I know is that things that are on two bytes or so 16 characters can sometimes be the least value first and the biggest value second. So for example, uh, 10, the one is the, the biggest value and the zero, the second character is lowest, or it can be the reverse. So it's 
it can mess a file completely if you use well the i agree one. with you but i don't yeah. need to know the details i need to know which one works yeah. <laughs> when no, i so, say so just when just I, tell, I told you i yeah. don't remember I so I have to <laughs> it. In yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah don't worry about it so in general um windows will default i think to little indian that's le that's the, LE. what it means i think yeah. that's what windows defaults to but out of hotkey itself doesn't use that it defaults to um, the WTF eight. So even no, but when, you, file, when you specify so, 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 file encoding sixteen, what right. does it default it, to? It will it will use the one that the Windows uses, and you don't have to worry about it. So if you specify sixteen, it will use the default one, and you don't have to even worry about it. So don't worry. Now in this case, I'm just going to use the ini write command. I'm just going to put some value into the same ini file that I had. And I just want to verify if the encoding of my file changes or not. That's what I'm not really sure about. So let's run it. That should have added some information to my file. And if I go to my file, it looks like it did add the information, but the file encoding stayed, st stayed as it was saved. So it seems to me that if you file append, if you use file append first to select an encoding, and then later on, you use any write to it as many times as you want. Uh, let me see. Doesn't overwrite. It, doesn't it will not overwrite the, the character encoding. But if you didn't specify that at any point, what would happen is that they, if you use any write first, it would create a, a WTF. Um, uh, let me let me just show that. So if I delete the any file by itself, and I just go ahead and any write to that file from scratch, it would use a different encoding. So right now, if I open it, my encoding now is little Indian, In it, which is what I just told you, um, Guy. Mm -hmm. Little Indian, the LE, is the default encoding for Windows. So if you use any write on a file that doesn't exist, it will default to the Windows file encoding, which is UTF-16. Little Indian. And if you actually used file append first with a specific encoding for your any file, and later on you use any write, it will not overwrite whatever encoding you selected. That's good to know. I didn't know that part. So this is very interesting. Uh, is, is that encoding also known as Pocahontas? The Pocahontas, the little Indian one. <laughs> yeah, very likely. <laughs> what? What? Are, now this, it's not really related. However, is this, do a, a a thirty second overview of the uh, the new line, the line return and new line, because it's one of the things that's sort of related, and a lot of people don't they get caught up in that as well, right? Of, right. So, what happens is again, Windows has its own way of doing its thing. Uh, in this one, Windows is actually. Uh, far away from from what the other sections of the of the operating system do. Whenever you save a file, uh, the files every time you hit a new line, there is a a hidden character in there that you probably cannot see. Let me see if I have a way to. I, I think Notepad shows them right. Um, site for auto hockey does as well. You can easily turn. Okay. It and Windows does it. You can set on uh, Word. Sorry, you, on Word you could set the um, hidden characters on. I think. Uh, At least that'd be right. So this one doesn't have it. Uh, site for Auto Hotkey. Do I have it there? Let me see. Uh, let me do it. And I think Notepad plus plus you could set the hidden characters on. Yeah, Notepad plus plus has it. Let me do that one. Well, yeah, but there's a different. We're just trying to show them, guy. Right. Yeah, no, I was saying it's about it, it, it'll show them. Right, exactly. So well, I could show exactly. the the show symbols. characters. Yeah. Right. Well, but the point being, is Ace talking through of like you can set them too? Is you know what it actually is using? So yeah. right. So so here's the. Let me first explain what it is. Every time you hit enter on your keyboard on any file, it would insert two characters there that uh, are a carriage return and a line feed, right? And that is in Windows. Windows defaults to this type of line ending. Now, what happens is these characters are not shown. Actually, you cannot see them, but they are there. 
right? Now, what happens is in Unix systems like Linux and Mac OS and any other file operating system out there like Android and stuff like that, what they do is that they use what is called a line feed character only. They do not add this carriage return. This car carriage return has to do with, you remember these typing machines, these writing machines that you had a long time ago, that whenever you had to do a new line, you had to push this lever to kind of like come back to the beginning of the thing. That's what it meant to replicate. But now in computers, we don't do that. So you just have a new line, a line feed. That's So everybody dropped the carriage return. Windows decided, no, let's use that. So some files, if you are not aware of the carriage return or the line feed, how they use it, some parts of your script, if you're using, for example, regular expression matching or you know file reading with a specific, for example, loop, if you're parsing by new lines, you might have a little bit of an issue because every time you parse, with a carried return here. And then let me show you a little bit of code that will do that. So if you say loop parse, um, and you have a variable that has text, that has carriage return. So this is my text. So if I'm doing that, and you say new line only like this, every time it gets a line, the line will contain a carriage return because Windows gives you that by default. And that would be a problem if you are not expecting it to be there. And that's the reason why you have this additional parameter when you're parsing about ignoring certain things. And in the example in AutoHotKey, in the documentation, you see that the example says, new line, ignore the carriage return. That's what that means. So yes. you're ignoring the CR in this. So if you're doing something with a regex and it's acting really weird, weird. Display the line return characters because it can be a big aha. I remember I got tripped up a lot when I was doing a regex. Now, Isaiah, also, do you do you happen to recall the other day when we were doing a regex and I said, isn't there's one character in regex that, that'll look for any sort of line return? Do you remember yes. what it was? Yes, sure. So again, uh, this type of issues with new lines and stuff like that is very common in regular expression. So if you're using regex match um, and you're saying, uh, you know, my variable match word until the end of the line like this, which is a line feed, or if you use it with the regex way of doing it, they mean the same. If you're doing that, it will not match if it is a carriage return line feed, you know? So in AutoHotKey, you have a way to force which type of new lines the text contains by setting an option. So you can put uh, some options at the beginning of your regex with a um, parenthesis like this. One of the options is uh, the dash n, uh, the tick n, which would say is only line feeds, which this clearly is not. So it's not gonna match. Or you can say, uh, Rn, which is carriage return line feed, which in this case it would match. But then you have the option of setting the A, tick A, which match all types of new lines. So these would match um, carriage return or line feed by itself. So this is actually very, I think it is uh, good to know whenever you're doing regular expressions that whenever you have a regular expression that is going to match some new lines, whatever it is, then go ahead and <laughs> use this option so that it matches correctly. If not, you're going to have some weird stuff going on. Hello, I'm here. <laughs> hey, hey. Hello. How are you doing? Welcome. Hey, sorry. No worries. Uh, my uh, daughter was literally covered in poo. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Oh, <laughs> that happens. Yeah, that happens. Yeah, my uh, dog is uh, kind of out the door. Uh, so my daughter was in the backyard and uh, kind of rolled in stuff. So, so for those of you who don't yeah. have kids yet, just make note this is a normal thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it is. It is. <laughs> my life sounds crazy, but like Joe said, it's normal. <laughs> Tom, someone asked earlier, let me see if I can scroll back up to it on my channel. They, they asked about um, using AutoHotKey 
uh, is it possible to script game controller input with auto hotkey? And I know you've done a couple of videos on stuff like that, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so he, what, what was the question again? It was uh, how to possible to script game controller input with auto hotkey. Game controller input, I think. I would just use uh, like the, um, when you right click on your uh, HK uh, file, you can push buttons and see like, a, what's it called? Oh yeah, the key history. We were talking about yeah, that recently. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, honestly, that's like the best way to do it. Uh, as far as uh, gaming with HK, uh, the, the first thing I always say is uh, window mode. Because if you're full screen, a lot of games won't work with uh, HK. Uh, plus, HK can have uh, blocks. They see you're running an HK file, and it'll just shut down. Uh, <clears throat> so if you're playing like an online game, if it's competitive, don't use HK. I love HK, but don't use it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious, or maybe as Ace knows this, if you were to compile your script and call it something else would it st still be able to to block it to identify it and block it uh i mean it depends if it's a really good one yes uh they can still detect because the original code is actually still there i mean you can take an executable drag it into notepad and still see the hk code uh if it's like a really yeah, good game, uh, World of Warcraft, for they example. Can't, they can't peek at your other executables. I mean, I, I, I don't think that's something they can do, right? It's No, no, it's it's less likely for sure. Uh, so yeah, uh, turn into an executable, uh, run it as admin, be in window mode. That's the first like three things I always say to people. And I don't know, 90% of the time it works. Awesome, thanks. Um, Dan has a question. He said, "You ready?" Dan? Um, um, yes. Am I unmuted? Um, yeah. I, I just wrote in the question in chat. Let's see if it works here. So um, I am trying to write scripts for the medical database software called Epic. Some of you may have heard of it. It's the most common database software. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't use control elements. So. Auto hotkey doesn't have all its best tools. You can still search for um, images. And I have successfully wrote a small program that looks for a small checkbox, uses the coordinates and puts a check in the checkbox. Um, what I'd like to do is search, um, uh, when we request records from a different hospital, um, it has two message, it has some built-in shortcuts. Um, and I'm gonna put share screen on to show the two things I'm looking for. The building shortcut, unfortunately, uh, alt n is used on two different ways depending on what it's being displayed. Let me see if I can get share screen working. Yeah, um, and we don't have to stop what you're doing. I'm just curious if you've tried the UIA, the new stuff that's been available. Um, I've not done anything that's brand new in auto hotkey. Okay. Um, I, I guess I, you have all kinds of knowledge that I don't have. Um, let's see. Um, do I have share screen up? I'm a little confused. Um, uh, yeah, look at the bottom of the toolbar, it looks like a green button. There you go. So, um, oh, and you can see my screen now. Yes. Um, there's um, a, at the top, there's one black box that has the word next and then cancel remaining requests. Underneath that, there's one that says cancel requests and cancel remaining requests. You can notice that it has is the underscore shortcuts mm -hmm. that yes. you can use the alt in, and those work fine. However, there's a problem in that they did not design their software very well in that um, alt in is used for next, which you go through many, you, you have like a list of maybe 20 that you're going okay. through and you're hitting alt in all the time. And then finally, there's one where it doesn't have the data available yet. You have to wait for it. And it comes up with a second screen down here that has the red X and then cancel requests. Mm -hmm. um, and if you hit Alt N because you're so in the habit by oh, then. Oh, the cancel has an N as well. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It was poor programming choice on their part. Yeah, I understood. <laughs> and so what I want to do is write something that looks for this. These are snippets from the screen mm -hmm. um 
so I want to write something that recognizes these two things, the top and bottom one. Um, some general questions are when you're using this technique of looking for a snippet, is there any efficiency in having as small as possible or as big as possible? Uh, searching for colors alone, would that be useful? How do I make an auto hotkey script efficient to look for these things? Should I make some parts of these pictures? What I would first do before we answer those questions, because I'm not knocking it, is, is this something you are just going to be running on your computer? Mm -hmm. um, yes. At least, you know, maybe sometime in the future, if I succeed, I might share it with a colleague, but um, I don't have any plans to sell it at this time, if okay. that's what you're no, meaning. No, um, you might have been giving it to a lot of colleagues or, you know, even just two. Um, image search is like the last thing in the world I would do if you're planning to use, use it on other computers. It's it's almost the last thing I would do at all, right? Let's put it that general, way. Yeah. Just because it's just not reliable, right? Do I have any choice? Well, that's yeah. that's the UI automation one is it's 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 pretty amazing. It doesn't solve all your problems, but it might be and it's it's programmatic and I mean closer to programmatic compared to um to this, right? No. So fast, reliable, consistent. I I do have a question. I'm sorry. Sure. Uh, those buttons. So this program is just a, a, a program that is not related to AutoHotKey, I would assume, right? No. Correct. In fact, I'm accessing it through uh, Citrix. I was going to say. Oh, right. That. So, yeah. <laughs> because, yeah. But no, 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 no. So that, that, that makes, that adds a layer of complexity. Maybe by that time, if you're accessing it through Citrix, you are actually your only choice would be oh. image search, probably. Not not entirely true with uh -huh. what is this. Uh -huh. is, just, on this. just to throw it out there, because it's probably not going to happen. But is it at all conceivable that you could get someone to install auto hotkey on the remote computer? Or or just compile the script and put it in the computer? Um, I think not, because yeah. um, even Citrix when even when you're on the um, so I'm accessing it often from RDP, but even when I'm on the terminal in the building, uh, it's still using, you still go through Citrix, even no, if you're okay. so physically no, there. One of our um, clients, um, they're, they're, um, they wanted us to automate something for them. We had to remote in using RDP to a computer that then used Citrix to automate this other program, right? That's however, what I'm doing. Right. However, yes. they... Thankfully, we're able to put auto hotkey on that remote computer. And it was a little bit better. Yeah. So I doubt I can, even if that was po technically possible, okay. and it might be, I doubt I have the yeah, power. Yeah, I just thought I'd throw it out there because it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it change, it's a game changer if you could. Right? Oh, sure. That would make it much easier. But, now, in this case, it looks like, as you actually guessed, like that's your only option, like have image going on. So if we're on that uh, situation, which you do have to do image search, there's two things that I would suggest in general. The first one, instead of an image, so quick question: Do you have do you have control over the dimensions of the screen? I'm sorry, Joe, you want to say something? There, was, there is one other thing that you should at least be aware of, mm -hmm. conceivably, because I actually had another one that was very similar to this, and, and either approach worked. Is it at all conceivable? that you could get programmatic access either to the database that's behind the thing or a public API, an API, because yeah, that, this that's might be the interface too. that they're having you use because this is what everyone uses, but it's conceivable that either there's a SQL database behind the scenes that you could actually, you know, connect get to. Connect to, or they have some sort of an API that you could interact with. I've actually explored on doing internet searches for this and there are people wanting to write three third-party software who are frustrated because of the lack of providing yeah. the apis yeah. uh, right here i'm gonna cut in uh so i've actually uh done epic uh software it's a basically it's a client database right yes yeah so uh my aunt actually worked in a, a hospital <clears throat> and she uses epic uh and she pretty much wanted the same thing you're wanting uh basically it came down to send commands that was okay was efficient unfortunately the best way a, 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 so sending keystrokes but let me let me go ahead and do something in this case uh, let me go ahead and 
finish what I was trying to mention. There's two ways that you can actually do this. Now, before I give you one of those ways, do you have control about the size of the screen or the size of the window that you're going to automate? So is there, some, is there something that you can actually make it a specific size? Yes. Or it can change the size? Okay, so yes. that's good. If you can set a specific size, instead of searching for images, I would get pixel colors. You say get pixel color. Uh, there's a command in our hotkey that gets okay. the pixel color in a specific position. But uh, yeah, go oh, ahead. Sorry, I have a comment. Um, mm -hmm. uh, each time, so it goes through like 20, 30 um, screens, each with mm -hmm. this. The position of this, what I've clipped here, changes based on, because there's text uh, uh -huh. on the upper part of the screen. So okay. sometimes this is uh, three inches down, sometimes it's two inches down, depending on how much stuff is above it. Quick question. So is, it's always, in, it's always it, in the same column. Though. It's always in the same column, but it, the, the, the height changes. Now yes. here's the thing. Um, this height, can you press like down, like home button or end button to always get to a specific position? Or no, no, it, it's depends. dependent on how much text oh, is right. being displayed above it. Right. So in that case, there's two ways. Again, let's let's go back to the two ways. I was gonna try pixel get color because that's the fastest and it's the most accurate one. But in this case you have the search for image option. Now, I, I might be able to do it down a column, which would narrow it down rather than the entire screen. That's but a good, we'll get back to right, that. That's, that's a good, um, so what you would do, what I would do is write, and I already have it, it's a little script that shows me the coordinates of the mouse. And yes. when I click, it saves the coordinates. Yes, I can do so that. I, so you can just go ahead and move to where the button is, where, where the green, for the next is, you see the green for next, this mm -hmm. little arrow? I yes. would click on one of the pixels at, in one specific spot. Like for example, in the middle where, where uh -huh. but because I want to differentiate it from the done one. The done one is kind of like a little check mark. So I would take the, the point of the check mark on the right, you see where, where it's pointing up. I would take that one, but that's not, so I would, for the next, I would grab the pixel to the left, and for the done, I would grab the pixel to the right. That's what I'm trying to get at. But if you save the coordinates, the Y position, well, the, the Y column is going to give you the height and the X is going to give you the column. So I would get the X position of the three and that would give you, you can then look from Y zero until Y end, like uh, linearly, which is a good solution, but to make it easier for you, I would actually recommend the Sheen library. Um, Joe, maybe you have the link for that one. Yeah. So Sheen has this library for searching images, which I have noticed that is really fast specifically, and it seems to be stable enough. What I cannot comment on is how reliable it is. Because as we were discussing, if you're using it only in your computer, the colors don't change much. But as soon as you move that same program into a different computer, the colors of the image might change a little bit, and that might be a little bit of an uh, of a problem. Interesting. But, I had right. imagined that it, they were all coded as the same color. No. No. Okay. So, no. So what happens with image search specifically, and that's why we usually don't recommend it unless it's kind of like a last resort is that your monitor has a, a color space and colors that are encoded in a specific color are displayed in a specific color. And image search actually takes your the color that is being displayed, not the one that was originally there. Oh, so, interesting. Right, so in, in another computer, the same color might look a little bit differently. And that's why you have color spaces Besides um, the resolution and everything else. The resolution, the size of the image, and those kind of things. So that's, that's why I would first go with pixel get. Okay, So if you can figure out how to get, you know, reliably the column and the, the column and the height of where those, well, not the height, but the column, in which column there are, and just look for that color. And go down it, a loop search. through all the, the yeah. a, a vertical loop. Exactly, the, exactly. And as soon as you find it, just go out of the loop. 
that's good. And second of all, um, have a little bit of room, like five pixels of color. When you see the pixel get color, uh, I think it has a little bit of room for, um, if you give it a color, it's not exactly that color, but five pixels or, you know, five. That, I that's know. though I would say something like fine text or automate my task might help with some of the, you know, not blurring, but yeah. Um, yeah, so this, this, this range of color, the color, it has five points in the range up and down, just in case it doesn't find the exact color, it would find colors that are, are similar. That's what is going on. So um, I would go with pixel get first. If that proves to be complicated or difficult to do, image search, or as I mentioned, the Sheen library for image searching. How do you spell Sheen? Uh, so uh, we sent it in the chat, okay. right in the chat, you have a, a link to that particular library and and good luck with that one. <laughs> so do that as my last resort, it sounds complex. It is, I mean, you, you gotta know what you're doing. Um, the fine text is definitely much more user-friendly. And the thing about fine text that I don't think Automate My Task has built into it is with fine text, you can give it coordinates, like you were saying, you can say only search here, which, which definitely will help with your speed, you know? Mm -hmm. That's right. In general, any type of image search that you're doing always has to be bound to a specific location, because if not, it searches in all your desktops and it takes a long time to search something small. So, so the, you, you usually bound it to a specific region, then your search is going to be uh, fast. So I've tried, uh, I, I've worked with Epic. Uh, my aunt uses it. Uh, she has, I'm jealous, eight monitors. No joke. <laughs> <laughs> eight screens four by four and i'm like ah oh, that'd be a great gaming rig <laughs> uh but yeah uh basically i've done all the stuff you said uh with image search pixel search it's okay uh like you said it could be a little bit unreliable uh especially with such yeah i mean like green red like those, those colors, are gonna, yeah. pretty much all over your screen uh, basically what I came up with, uh, for what she wanted was, uh, she was doing some type of like, uh, rotation kind of thing, where it was just like cycling through, uh, uh, information, seeing if it had like a flag on it and then give her a message. Uh, basically send commands was the best thing I came up with. It was on that particular, effective. Yeah. it was fast. Uh, you know, like pixel search uh, versus a message box, it can be a little faster. Uh, but yeah, that's basically what I came up with is just literally send commands. It sucks, but <laughs> sometimes yeah. you have to go with it. <laughs> yeah, and, and the one thing I will just throw it out there, even though I understand the stuff changes, um, when working with Citrix, you know, you can do some crazy stuff with tabs. <laughs> um, and at least the tabs get sent and you can iterate over things, right? Compared to, like you said, there is no programmatic interface, unfortunately. So, but tabbing can allow you to navigate through stuff. So just as something to keep in mind. And that's actually a good point. Uh, that's actually why I went with send commands because she uses uh, Citrix also. Uh, so she'll have her, you know, she has her office with the eight freaking monitors. <laughs> mm -hmm. But sometimes she, yeah, she uh, works. Uh, remotely so it was uh, just efficient we didn't have to rely on like the coordinates being the same every single time if she was on this screen that screen it just automatically you know tab three times press enter etc so it, it, it was it was the best way to go unfortunately <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm related to this but a tip i found on getting monitors for cheap. I don't know if you have a Best Buy outlet store near you. They sell the best, the open box, big screen TVs. And that's what I'm using as my computer monitors. I bought a, a 50 inch diagonal 4K display for $125, which Holy is really, <laughs> and so that's at the outlet store that you typically only have one per state or maybe a big place like Texas has a couple, but um, so look, find out where it is. They're all open box, but they've been guaranteed to work. And you have the inconvenience of having you to use the remote control and switch, switch to HDMI. So you spend another minute turning it on. But once you got it, you've got a 4K display 
50 inch that you bought for 125. <laughs> so lovely, exactly. I'd love to have that in the UK, but not, not in the UK. <laughs> so I don't know what they've got there. So that's the Best Buy, which is a big chain store, but they have all the things that were the demos they collect at a um, sell the demos store, typically one per state. Huh. Yeah, we don't have Best Buy in uh, Delaware anymore. They closed, uh, they removed uh, five years ago or something like that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Anyway, so uh, you, you, you'd place. be worth driving for that price. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. I'll say I'm in Delaware. Uh, I can drive in 10 minutes to New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Maryland. <laughs> I have to look it up. <laughs> Anyway, so back to the other topic. So better searching for colors than than searching for an image. I would, um, I would, I would personally. It's not like one is better than the other. In the end, you're going to have the same issue. The only thing is that searching for an image has additional things that you have to consider. Like, for example, as Joe mentioned, the resolution of the screen and the resolution okay. of the image you took. So with Pixel Get Color, you don't have to worry about that because if your screen is 10 by, you know, the 1090 by 180p, right? Like, like the 180, 1080p, the normal ones. But he, your friend's computer is 720. It might work, but it might not work. So it, as soon as you have this variation in monitor resolution, the image that you took might be found, might not, might, might be not found. And that's why I don't really like it. I don't like um, there is a way. There is a way around that is... Mm -hmm. Um, working with the lowest common denominator is resizing the window to a set resolution. Uh, and then even if you're working with a high definition monitor, sure. it resizes right. the window to only use that part of the window. Um, and then you could, the image search will work better uh, because it's the same resolution as um, you know, uh, you don't need a 15 inch monitor when you're working with Citrix, your eyes are kind of going left and right, you know, you don't work with Citrix in the cinema, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, you're too close to the monitor, uh, you know, if you're working at, you know, 15 foot away with a 15 inch monitor, that's perfect. But when you're sitting three foot, right, four right, foot away yeah, from it, right you there, cannot right. work with that size. So you have to resize the window to a smaller window anyway. So if you resize it to, you know, a size that you would normally use, um, you'd find that it'll work better. Okay. Do I need to worry about measuring, having the column uh, position change depending on window size, in which case I might want to measure, have AutoHotKey measure the window width before I get started? Well, I'll have to experiment with that. If you set the window width of the Citrix window with AutoHotKey. Yes, I could do that. So you can do that. So every time you use AutoHotKey, it resizes the window to a set size. So you could read the size of the window that was. You can then set it to a set size to do your operation. And when you've done your operation, you can set it back to the size it was originally for the user. If you want to go that, but it, that will make it that will make it universal, you know. Um, uh, and you can even you know, but that means windows are changing size all the time. But yeah. it'll work. It'll work with any environment, you know, uh, or it'll be more. It'll be more reliable. I think. Um, I think in general, uh, let's just. You should just focus on getting the first one to run, and then later on you think about okay. what other. You know, but try to figure out if pixel get image, uh, pixel get, or image search is better for you, whatever it is. Um, but after you get that, then you figure out other steps that you might take on that particular. Thank you. I'll explore this. I'm going to ask a different question, but probably this is a really super easy one for you guys. Um, if I have a, a loop running with no control in it because I don't have a condition that stops it other than condition that the human user would see, what's the best way for a keyboard, for a person, the user, to use a keyboard signal to stop a really simple loop? Escape. So yeah. by hitting the, you mean hitting the escape button? Are you, I mean, he, what Guy is implying is a hotkey. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. So, so put the uh, escape command. Uh, yeah, maybe I'm not understanding. Well, it just um, depends on, you know, what you know. Like, I don't personally don't like escape because I use escape in a lot of other things, right? 
So yeah. I'll use like control escape, you know, something like that to make it a little more specific. But he's just saying assign a hotkey to tell it to break. Isaiah, you want to show him a quick? So mm -hmm. do I need to put a conditional in the loop, check for uh, key held down escape? And yeah, no, well, there, it depends. Yeah, that's one that you can use. And basically, but there is this other way that, well, let me share my screen real quick. So you can... Um, Just a heads up, uh, five minutes. Okay, yeah. So there is this, uh, let me see something. There is this command in other hotkey, max threads per hotkey. Yes. Yeah, so this is what you might want to use. So you set this guy to two, so that allows you to have two threads. That means that if you're in a loop, so let's say that you have a hotkey that says F1, loop all the time it doesn't matter when if uh you know get out then break right now what happens is what you want to do let's have a return here you can have a second hotkey f2 uh, equals get out equals toggle so that would be get or just out. one or something right yeah. so so this thing puts get out into two and one so it just flips it if it was if it was not set it would set it to true if it was true it would set it to false so that it just flips it now um a really basic question does your loop stop to to is it interruptible does it read that you that's the point down? that's the that's the point that i'm trying to make if you if you create a loop, it starts a thread, and no other hotkeys would work. Yes. But if, if you put here max threads per hotkey two, ah. that allows you to it, it. The second thread of the other hotkey here would be run even if the loop is running. So this is the key. The, the key part of this is that you can create this particular command up here. And that will allow you then that when you press F2, it switches the variable. And as that is one of my conditions, if it is switched to true, then it would go out of the loop. That's what is going on. Wow, that's really highly okay. useful. So let me tool tip that the index. And let's test it. So if I press F1, I should get a loop. If I press F2, it stops. This is, is what it? I need. Thank you. Right. So it is something, it's a simple way of getting kind of like to get out of a loop. But usually in other cases, I use other methods that we will see probably next time. Um, I, put code something in the, in the, in the, I put some code in the um, chat that if you hold down the escape key, hold it down for a period of, let's say, number of seconds, it you can tell it to do something like exit the app or something like that or set your variable for instance to to get out you would still need the max threads too for that method yes I think. Any, anything that has two hot keys work. so anything that has a loop going because i think guy you remember that we were talking about threads last yes. last time when you are inside a thread no other thread can start so if you inside that loop need a hotkey to work, you would have to have more threads available for the other hotkeys to work. And, and would that would is it... not exactly true, guys. Okay. Can you it's max threads per hotkey. So a single hotkey subroutine needs that setting to fire okay. multiple times. Okay, right. But not the but when you have when you have parallel hotkeys, as long as they are uh with the single with the same um what is it called? The thread priority for both hotkeys you can basically fire them simultaneously okay. or the other one after the that that's yeah, a good to know i didn't know that one <laughs> there you go yeah uh, do code i think it's just a little example to say write your code here is what he was guy was implying yeah 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 it's just um it's just a, a way of of being <laughs> able to use the escape key uh to trigger it while you while holding it down for three seconds so if i hit escape nothing happens but if yeah. i hold it down for three seconds then it fires yeah we're out of time so um we got to jump thank over you. to the hero hour so thank you all yeah. thank you very much uh, <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. 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 welcome to see you there
um, sign up if you haven't already. <laughs>